Why don't we talk now about the question of historical precedent? Um, Fee, spend, Fee and Stewart spend some time on this notion of historical precedent. And what do they mean by this? Um, they're, they're really talking about various types of reforming or restorationist movements, okay? um, and of which there have been many in the history of the church, uh, one of which is the Methodist movement and its beginnings in England in the 1700s. Um, among these restorationist movements, there is a tendency to want to recreate the early church somehow. And it just never quite happens. Uh, why doesn't it ever happen? Well, probably because we're not the early church. We're different than the early church. We live in a world with two billion Christians in it. And, you know, we have various different forms of, of Christianity and different kinds of beliefs. And we don't live in the ancient Mediterranean world. And so our life circumstances are, are very different. And Christianity is in some ways just going to look different than it did in the early church. Now, that's not to say that we abandon any of the principles of the early church. But um, the question of historical precedent can be taken, or the issue of historical precedent can be taken simply too far. Okay, so for example, um, Acts. Let's look at chapter 1. Now, when they have to identify a new apostle, um, two people were nominated. I guess they had a nominations committee, the very first <laughs> church nominations committee. And um, two people were nominated, Justice and Matthias. Now, how do they decide between Justice and Matthias? All right, they cast lots, which is like drawing straws or throwing dice. Now, I don't know that that is the, the method that we want to most often employ in the life of the church for making <laughs> decisions, right? If I'm trying to, you know, if I go to my board of trustees at the seminary and they're asking me questions about the budget, and I say, you know, I don't really know. Why don't we cast lots to decide <laughs> this? You know, they're, the, the confidence that's going to inspire in the donors will probably not be fantastic. And so, now John Wesley, on the other hand, re really believed in casting of lots. He made important life decisions based on the casting of lots. And sometimes I think that the way in which we choose bishops in the United Methodist Church would be vastly improved if we cast lots. Um, nevertheless, that's an example of where we might not want to employ a strict notion of historical precedent. Okay? Um, Acts chapter 2, 43 to 47. Let's look at that. So, as these new communities of the Spirit are forming, um, it says in verse 44, All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. So... Um, you ready to do that? Nope. <laughs> no? Okay. In fact, I don't know, I mean, I know there have been Christian communities, but even some of the more um, zealous restorationist movements really haven't gone this far as to um, sell all their possessions and just simply distribute the proceeds among one another. You end up with Jim Jones, don't you? You end up with Jim Jones. Well, I suppose you could, yes. Um, and that is certainly to be avoided. But I, uh, what I'm saying here is not that it's bad that the believers did this. And if, you know, um, if there were a community of people who wanted to do this and they weren't led by a crazy person like Jim Jones, 
maybe it would be good. I don't know. But I don't think that what we're seeing here is the Bible commanding us that we have to live this way. And Fee and Stewart give us some important principles for deriving kind of which precedent which precedents we really need to take seriously. Okay? And one of them is if something is specifically commanded in Scripture. But in Scripture, it's not specifically commanded. It describes what these members of the early church did. But it doesn't, um, it doesn't necessarily command that that be the pattern for the church for all time moving forward. In fact, if that were the case, there probably wouldn't be a patron named Theophilus who has enough money uh, mm -hmm. for to become Luke's patron or the patron of Luke's church so he can write Luke and Acts. Um, so maybe this was the pattern of the very earliest Christian communities, but it soon seems to have um, fizzled out. Okay, any questions? Yeah, Jim. What if there is no original first page to go back to? I, 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 this all assumes that everyone was on the first page and that we're going to go back and, and get on that same page. But this is a church in formation. This is a church developing an understanding of the person of Jesus. This is churches moving between a Judeo to a, a Greco-Roman world. I don't know that my question is, and my answer to my question is, there is not a first page. Or not large, there's not, not, there's not, not a first well, page. Not everywhere a defined first page. Does right. that make sense? Or? Luke is giving us a picture of particular Christian, early Christian communities, and there might have been other early Christian communities that did different things. And, you know, we know, for example, that in the early church, there were uh, disputes about the role of the bishop. Um, and, and especially the threefold structure of bishop, deacon, and elder within the life of the church. Um, and we know this because um, of one of the writings of the Apostolic Fathers, Clement of Rome, and, or is it Ignatius? Ignatius, it's right, Ignatius. So okay, writes, yeah. yeah. And he's really insisting on this threefold classification of bishop, deacon, and elder. Now, why is he doing this? He's probably doing it because there are churches that aren't adhering to this threefold distinction. So. You know, we, we know that there were varieties of communities in the early church. There were disputes uh, that separated Christian communities from very early on. And so, um, as you're saying, the picture might not be as neat as Luke always portrays it, but that's simply because Luke is just giving us a picture of particular communities of the early church. Okay. Uh, let's look at Acts 3, 1 through 10. So um, Peter and John find a man who can't walk. He can't use his legs. And he asks them for alms. And Peter, it says in verse 4, looked intently at him as John did and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold. But what I have to give to you in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Now, so what we have here is a place where we have a man asking for money, and Peter and John don't give him money. They, they heal him. Now, it would be great if we all had that strong of an anointing for healing, uh, but we, we all don't. Um, I know people who, who really do have gifts of healing, uh, but even they don't heal all the time. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I, the precedent that we should not take away from this is, would be something like, well, rather than, rather than helping people financially, we should just pray for them or something like that. Well, sometimes people need financial help, and sometimes being a financial help is a way of being a good follower of Jesus. And we give of our, our monies. In the United Methodist Church, we say we, we give of our, um, uh, our not just our, our time and our talents, but our offerings as well. So there's another case where we just necessarily, sh we shouldn't necessarily make um, a historical precedent 
a rule for something that we go about doing today. You know, I believe in healing and uh, I pray for people to receive healing, but that doesn't mean that I'm free of my financial obligations within the life of the church. Okay, so there are lots of, of places in Acts and other places in the New Testament, especially, you know, in like First and Second Corinthians, where we could find examples of things that we might look at as historical precedent. Uh, for example, Paul's method of, of church discipline in 1 Corinthians 5, when you have a man living with his father's wife, and he's unrepentant, so Paul says, well, gather the community together and um, hand him over to Satan. Okay, well, you know, maybe that's not always the best uh, method of church <laughs> discipline. And so maybe there are other ways to go about the process of church discipline that are even more effective than handing someone over to Satan, you know, which basically means kicking them out of the community until they repent. So, um, you know, I would encourage you to work your way through fee and steward carefully in this passage and look at some of the rules that they have for establishing historical precedent and and identifying places where historical precedent precedent is is binding on us as Christians today. Uh, yes, question. Well, in light of that, I've yes. always wondered is there a Christian historical precedent, say for how we should treat, deal with the folks on the side of the road that are asking for help? Is there a Christian historical precedent of how we deal with homeless people, for example? Pe yeah. People asking for money on the side? Oh, like when you drive by someone to help us sign? Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, I think this is where we, we go back to um, Fee's notion that Scripture gives us that, that what we can do is we can derive certain principles from Scripture about the way in which we should regard other people. And there are always what we would call morally relevant circumstances in these instances. Where, for example, um, one time I, I, I used to, in downtown Dallas, serve um, food to the homeless with my church, and we'd have worship service with them. And um, one time a woman came in and we had already finished, we'd already cleaned everything up, it was already done. And I had to say to her, you know, at that time, I'm sorry, you know, we, you, you didn't make it this week, you know, and it, it stunk. But um, about a week later, I was at, um, I had walked over from my apartment to a bookstore. And this same woman, who I had had a conversation with last week, came up to me and handed me a card. And this card said that she was deaf and she couldn't speak and she needed money, okay? And I looked at her and I said, we just had a conversation last week, okay? And she looked at me and she took the card and she walked off. Now, in that case, right, what I'm identifying is, is she's trying to scam me there. And so it's probably not gonna be healthy for me to just give her money on the street. But I can give money to my church uh, that provides food for people who are coming into a structured situation where they can receive help. Or that will, at times, uh, provide cash or clothing for people who need that. Uh, but there's a structured way to distribute that. So we have to make judgment calls about these things, but we do that based upon principles that we derive from Scripture. Okay, thanks. <laughs>